good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN, a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between professors Mitch Prinstein and Eva Tultzer and Dr. Claudia Welke. Thanks for joining us. FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of nearly 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. A few introductions. Mitch Prinstein is the Chief Science Officer of the American Psychological Association and at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He serves as the John Van Cedars Distinguished Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience and the co-director of the Winston National Center on Technology Use, Brain, and Psychological Development. Mitch was here for FAN in 2017 for his book, Popular, The Power of Likeability in a Status-Obsessed World, and we are thrilled and really happy to welcome him back. Eva Teltzer is a professor of psychology and neuroscience at UNC Chapel Hill. She's an associate editor at Child Development and Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience and is the co-director with Professor Princeton of the Winston National Center on Technology Use, Brain, and Psychological Development. Her research examines how social and cultural processes shape adolescent brain development with a focus on both pro-social and risk-taking behaviors, family and peer relationships, and the role of social media in youth's lives. Claudia Welke is a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and the chief medical officer and co-founder of Compass Health Center and Compass Virtual. Compass is the largest provider of intensive non-hospital-based psychiatric care in Illinois, with over 600 staff, including 450 clinicians, treating over 700 crisis patients a day. Compass recently opened a location in Silver Spring, Maryland. And now let's welcome Mitch Prinstein, Eva Teltzer, and Claudia Welke. Hi, everyone. Um, before we dive in, in the spirit of it being two weeks before Thanksgiving, I'd like to start from a place of gratitude. Um, first, thank you, Lonnie and Fan, for your dedication to the community and for hosting what always feels like the most important conversations of the day. I also want to express gratitude to everyone listening out there, whether you're a parent, a student, an educator, a clinician, or just interested in this topic. It's important that you're all here. It's only together that we're gonna move the needle forward and improving the mental health of our young people. Thank you, Mitch and Eva, for, for your work on this topic and ensuring that the conversations are grounded in science and research, which allows us all to make the best possible decisions with our adolescents. And then just full disclosure, I have a 20 year old, an 18 year old and a 14 year old. So this topic is important to me, not only professionally, but personally as well. So Mitch and Eva, would you mind starting us off by highlighting some of the areas of your research that are of our most interest? Sure, we'd be happy to. And thank you so much to Fan and to Lonnie for this most amazing speaker series that we're honored to be a part of. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we're going to go uh, talk with you a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing to help frame some of this discussion about social media. We'll go pretty quickly so we have time to answer a lot of questions. It's no surprise to anyone that when you look at young people interacting together, the picture has looked somewhat like this, evolved to look like this, but most recently looks like that. And I'm sure you notice the difference. But why are we talking so much about the role of social media and technology? We've certainly had other movements that have changed the way in which we engage in social interactions before, from the printing press to the telephone to email. Well, there's some reason to think that this might be a very unique opportunity to think about our social interactions differently for a variety of different ways that have all at the same time changed with the advent of technology and social media use, perhaps especially the extent to which we've started to outsource some of our social decision making to computers for the first time in the history of our species that are now picking you know, who we're friends with or um, what order we see their posts and reminding us of when we should have social interactions with them. Is social media the issue that is causing the entire youth mental health crisis today? No, we don't believe so. Although people talk about the coincidence between the timing of uh, Facebook's launch and changes in mental health, and these are epidemiological data, you can actually see when taking a broader look that there has not been a precipitous incline, uh, either a gradual or a flat uh, distribution of symptoms in areas such as suicide, um, substance use, weight and body related issues and sadness and hopelessness since the time that Facebook has uh, launched and other technological platforms have started. But we do believe that there are some ways that social media is certainly changing adolescence development for better or for worse. And some of that has to do with the reasons that we understand as uh, related to the maturation of adolescents' brains. 
After the first year of life, the most important time for brain growth, development, and reorganization is during the adolescent transition when we see a remarkable change in how the brain is developing. And the brain doesn't develop all at once. One of the first regions that develops about a year or two before you see overt signs of puberty is an area within the central region of the brain that's shared with many other mammalian species that makes us feel particularly sensitive to social feedback and praise and reward. It's based on a proliferation of oxytocin and dopamine receptors. And um, so starting around the age 10 for most kids, you're gonna see, and most parents can probably relate to their kids talking about nothing but their peers, who sits with whom at the lunch table and who's popular and who's not, and who's getting positive attention and who's getting teased. It's important to recognize that this now has become also the time when many kids are getting access to their first devices, sometimes in a way that might exacerbate this kind of already biological sensitivity to their social uh, worlds and to social feedback. But it's not until at least the age of 25 when we see the last area of the brain to really reach full maturity, and that's an area that makes us inhibited. Uh, to the brain's breaks, as it were, to stop us from pursuing every possible impulse. So we do have a vulnerability window, that means, between when adolescents are particularly interested in social feedback from peers, but might not be able to stop themselves from pursuing that kind of feedback as much as they can uh, do so. When we talk about social media, it's important to recognize that social media is very different for every person who uses it and every platform that's out there. Um, we also recognize that social media is uh, comprised of at least three different aspects. It's the content that kids uh, develop or they seek out or is presented to them, combined with functions like endless scroll or the like button or the number of followers or comment features, plus an artificial intelligence component. So it's very hard to talk about social media as if it's one thing. It's really a combination of many different aspects that we have to take into account. And although uh, many people would like for our research to be able to specify an exact age at which one is experiencing risks or suddenly immune to any potential risks, of course, adolescent development is gradual and continuous. And at any age, there are many folks who have a, a great deal of competencies or maybe have not yet fully reached maturity and we have to be sensitive to that. Overall, I would say that the information that you've likely heard in the news and that um, you've heard summarized elsewhere has been a bit simplified. And our goal is to give you some more of a nuanced way of understanding this so you as parents or educators can feel empowered to make the right choices that make sense for your child and for your family. For instance, when people talk about the relationship between social media and mental health, they might not remember that mood and symptoms actually affect what kids choose to go look for it online. Tech can also provide opportunities for soothing and coping or can help kids develop skills they're not able to get. On the flip side, we have to remember that the more kids are spending time online, that's less time that they're engaged in other things they might have done otherwise, like physical exercise or learning in-person uh, in skills. And uh, one way of thinking about this is that it's a combination of a child and their predisposing strengths and, and vulnerabilities or areas of growth that combines with very specific kinds of tech behaviors that's most important to consider. A resilient adolescent who reads the news and talks about current events with their friends and the chat might be just fine as compared to a more lonely adolescent who's accessing the most addictive and harmful stimuli. We would like to suggest that the better question to ask ourselves and each other when it comes to social media is not whether it's all good or all bad, but under what conditions and for which children might there be specific aspects of social media that might help youth or might harm youth. The way that we as scientists look at that is to really explore a wide array of different, more complex questions. We won't have time to go through all of those in this brief preface to our discussion today, but we will try and highlight just a couple so that way you can get a sense of uh, the message being a little bit more complex and hopefully giving you the information you need to feel more empowered in this space. For instance, it's important to recognize that there are benefits of social media use on adolescent development. In fact, many have demonstrated that among those who represent are members of uh, marginalized or minoritized communities, the opportunity to interact with others who share a similar identity or can offer social support 
to deal with the minority stress that kids experience can be very helpful. In fact, kids can make friends with people online that they know they're never going to meet off of offline. And they report that those friendships can be quite high in friendship quality, buffering the effects of negative experiences like stress on even the worst outcomes like suicidal behavior. We know that during COVID, social media was an important aspect of why kids did not end up faring worse because of the companionship they experienced online. Um, research demonstrates that kids have greater diversity among their online peer contacts than they do in their offline peer contacts, which is good. And also we know that kids can start and engage in worldwide activism online, which is of course wonderful. Um, and that just couldn't happen before social media occurred. But at the same time, we also know that kids are more likely to be influenced by peers. And we've all had this experience where you might read an article online, you look in the comments section, you see two or three comments that are just outrageous, very different from your own personal opinion. And in that moment, we have a choice to say, well, it looks like there are two people out there with a really radical point of view. Or we might instead estimate, gee, I wonder if half the country feels that way. And I suddenly feel very much isolated in my own, my own feelings and beliefs. Well, this happens with adolescents, perhaps even more so. Research has demonstrated that simply seeing, for instance, posts talking about drinking alcohol with likes attached to them, actually over time changes adolescents' perceptions of how much they think all their peers approve of irresponsible and dangerous levels of drinking alcohol. And once they have that opinion of their peers or that perception of their peers' attitudes, that actually longitudinally predicts ninth graders' own engagement in heavy episodic drinking or drinking five or more drinks on a single occasion, really elegantly showing how what we see online is changing our perceptions of the world, which in turn changes our behavior. But remember that this process also can work to promote adaptive behaviors. So if kids were to see posts talking about community service or being kind or empathic, that information can change their opinions of what their peers think of good behaviors. And that might help them to lead to uh, adaptive outcomes. Let me turn it over to Dr. Telzer to talk about a couple of other areas of our research. Thank you. So one of the areas that we find really important to study is that of sleep. Sleep is so essential to adolescents' functioning and well-being. And we know that sleep is um, deprived among adolescents. So this figure here is showing the percent of adolescents who get the recommended eight hours of sleep per night. And what you can see here is that in the ninth grade, so in those early high school years, only about 40% of adolescents are getting the recommended amount of sleep per night, eight hours. And by 12th grade, that's sharply declined. So that only about a quarter of adolescents are getting the required amount of sleep so that they can function. So adolescents, even out of the context of social media, are really sleep deprived. Now we know that Poor sleep in adolescence is linked to a host of negative outcomes. Poor sleep is linked to obesity, depression, risky behaviors. It's linked to negative school performance the next day. And what's really important is that it's also linked to the way that adolescents' brains are developing. So we can see that it is associated with uh, declines in how the brain is creating and making connections across the adolescent years. So poor sleep is just so essential for adolescents functioning. And yet 60% of adolescents report viewing or interacting with the screen with their screens in the hour before bedtime. And so a really important question is whether this screen time and being engaged on social media before bed might be impacting their sleep, which is already deprived during these adolescent years. <clears throat> so this figure here on the right is showing those links between poor sleep and brain health. We see these declines in structural development in the brain for adolescents who are getting greater um, or poorer sleep in the adolescent years. We've also seen that um, adolescents who are using their smartphones at night in particular, smartphone use during the daytime is not necessarily associated with sleep health, but adolescents who are picking up their phones and hours before sleep 
end up having later sleep onset and shorter sleep duration. And adolescents who wake up in the middle of the night, those who go and reach over for their phones end up having a longer wake event in the middle of the night. So one of the key areas for us to focus on is really taking screens and phones out of adolescents' rooms so that their sleep is able to be as healthy and optimal as possible so that they can function in their daily lives and so that their brains can develop in healthy ways. Another important consideration is when social media behaviors might become more problematic. So as Dr. Princeton said, there's many ways in which social media behaviors are highly adaptive and important for adolescents, but there's a point at which social media behaviors may interfere with adolescents' daily functioning and become more problematic. So what we've done is we've asked adolescents questions to try to get at whether or not their social media behaviors are more problematic. For example, do you ever feel like you spend more time on social media than you intended? Have you ever tried to spend time away from social media, but you couldn't do it? Do you ever expend extra effort to make sure you'll continue to have access to social media when you might not otherwise have it? And so on. So these are questions that really get at adolescents' inability to engage in their everyday activities, whether that's schoolwork or sleep or physical activity, or they have these really strong cravings caused by social media. And when we ask adolescents these questions, what we find is that nearly all adolescents report that they're spending more time on social media than they intended. About half report that being away from social media results in experiencing difficulties in their everyday activities. And about a quarter perceive that they're actually moderately or even severely addicted to social media. So for a majority of adolescents, there may be signs that they're engaging in more problematic aspects of social media behavior. And this is where we might want to um, expend our energy to help adolescents make sure that social media is not interfering with their daily functioning. So the last area that we want to talk about is how social media might actually be interacting with the developing brain. So Dr. Princeton mentioned earlier that the adolescent years is actually this very important developmental period when the brain is undergoing more development and reorganization than any other period in development except in that first year of life. It's a time when the brain becomes so sensitive to its social environment because of the way it's rewiring around the time of puberty. And so we were really interested in whether the way that adolescents engage on these social media platforms might actually be related to changes in how their brain is developing and responding to the environment over this really important developmental period. So this is um, showing you here um, some really compelling data where we collected objective measures of how much time and notifications adolescents are spending and getting on their phones every single day for two weeks. We asked adolescents to send us these screenshots of their phone usage. So it's not retrospective, it's not self-report. We're getting really objective data about how much time they're on their phones, how often they're checking their phones, how many notifications they're getting. And we end up with thousands of data points. And what this graph is going to um, depict to you, it might look like a, a whole lot of dots and blurry lines, but essentially each one of these rows is a day of the week where we collected data. And if you zoom in, I know it's hard to see, but the axis there is on the top showing the number of times adolescents are picking up their phone every day. That axis ranges from zero times a day all the way upwards of four to 500 times per day. So adolescents on average, they're picking up and checking their phone a hundred times a day, but for some adolescents, they're doing that upwards of 400 times a day. They are constantly checking their phones, looking for information from their peers, getting notifications. They are glued to their phones. The bottom of the um, graph is showing the number of minutes they're spending on their smartphones each day. Again, if you zoom in onto that y-axis, it ranges from zero minutes a day upwards of over a thousand minutes a day. So on average, adolescents are spending 500 minutes a day. That's over eight hours a day. A work day for many of us is spent glued to their phone on their screens. And this is just their smartphone. You can imagine they may have other screens in their lives of their iPad or other things. 
And so we're really interested in how this might be associated with their developing brain. Is this habitual checking behavior associated with the way the brain develops during this really important time? So using this longitudinal method, we scanned adolescents' brains over time, and we looked at the link between their habitual social media checking behaviors and how their brain's developing and find this really important association where adolescents who are habitually checking their social media accounts are showing these longitudinal increases in brain activation in areas of the brain that are like very sensitive to the salience of the world. They're becoming hypersensitive to peer feedback. So this suggests for the first time that the way the adolescents are interacting and engaging on their phones might actually be changing the way that their brain is developing during this really critical period of development. So I think we're gonna end our question or our presentation there and move more towards what can we do given all of this information that we've learned. And just to kick off our discussion, we'll um, just mention a couple of the recommendations that we're very glad that our research and um, was captured in the health advisory from the American Psychological Association, as well as the Surgeon General's health advisory to lead to some very helpful suggestions that could be used by educators, by tech companies, legislators, but also by parents themselves. We really think it's important to recognize that there are ways you can use social media to promote healthy socialization. We're happy to talk about that. The tech companies and the platforms should probably have a way in which the experiences of an eight-year-old are a little bit different than the experiences of an 80-year-old on there. But right now, a lot of what's done on there is built for adults and kids are experiencing it without any protections necessarily. Parents can't look over their kids' shoulders when they're using social media, of course, all the times they're using it. But there are ways to have helpful conversations to make sure that there is some opportunity to let kids know that they can come with questions, they can talk about routinely what they're seeing, what they're processing, and how they're making sense of it. We absolutely believe that cyber hate needs to be taken down immediately, as, con as is content that over 50% of kids are reporting that they see that actually teaches them how to engage in maladaptive behaviors like anorexia-like behaviors or cutting behaviors, and the sites actually even tell them how to conceal that from their parents. We think it's important for parents to be aware of the signs of problematic social media use, so that way we can put in restrictions or limits if our child is starting to look somewhat addicted. Absolutely, we don't need any legislation or any companies to do anything to create a group norm that says at nine o'clock, let's all shut off our devices and let's teach our kids that it's time that uh, we're all putting that away so we can engage in a healthy amount of sleep. Also, physical activity is important. It's so critical to teach kids how to understand that what they're seeing very often is fake or curated and selected. So how do we limit social comparison? We need to make sure that all teens are trained on social media literacy as well. Because if everyone understood that what they're seeing might not always be real, they might be getting fooled on purpose with mis and disinformation, they understood the psychological concepts that make us misestimate based on what we're seeing and so on, then kids might have the competencies they need to be able to get the best out of social media and really avoid some of the worst. With that, I'm very excited to answer questions that uh, you all might have, but just wanted to mention that thanks to a generous donor, we were able to develop and then make completely free and open access this handbook on adolescent digital media use and mental health. And it's a, um, a book that can be downloaded completely and totally for free just by visiting um, this website. And you'll see a link there as well as brief video summaries of each chapter to make it easy to consume. Thank you. That was great. Thank you for, for starting off, off with that, that wealth of information. Um, so as the, you know, I think you made the point really well, not all so social media use is the same. And one of the things that we're, uh, that we're seeing is that the research is moving more towards like sort of thinking about the nuances in terms of what specifically teenagers are doing online. Um, and we hear a lot about this social comparison and, and feedback seeking, um, feedback seeking as being problematic. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the problems associated with these and why adolescents are so uniquely affected? Yeah, so, you know, when we ask adolescents why they spend time on social media, they tell us everything from, well, it's kind of like having your own TV channel perfectly curated to your own interests. And I just do it when I'm bored. I'm looking for entertainment to um, people that say it's really an opportunity to connect with friends or 
slash they might actually feel pressure to have to be on there to interact with friends. They're fearing what they might be missing out. But there are a remarkable number of kids that will go ahead and say that one of the reasons why they're on is because they're trying to get a follower count and they're trying to get positive feedback to what they post, either to have enough of a follower count to actually start earning income or just because it helps them to feel better about opportunities that they're not getting offline to get social feedback. And that particular use of social media is actually longitudinally associated with increases in anxiety, depression, and weight-related, uh, maladaptive weight-related behaviors as well. Because of course, no one feels good about themselves when they compare themselves to others on social media. But kids are sometimes um, not only getting different uh, representations of body shapes and whatnot, but they're also seeing what they believe are representative samples of their friends having social interactions without them or looking great when they wake up in the morning or you know being happy all the time. And it really is tricky for teens who are just developing their ability to understand complex social experiences. And this is not giving them a very complex and teaching moment at all. It's actually giving them a, a lot of information that most of us might forget is probably curated or, or maybe even fake. And along those same lines, um, you know, as we think about social comparison, a lot of times we, we sort of think about girls at this age. And we know that, you know, starting at age 12, teenage girls are almost twice as like, likely um, as boys to, to experience depression and anxiety. Um, and can you comment a little bit more on the gender differences and sort of thinking about boys and girls and, and social media? Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about sort of questions in regards to, um, you know, sort of how they feel about their bodies um, and, and sort of we, we think boys tend to, to do a little bit more in terms of video game playing. So any, any comments there? Um, yeah, we, we actually um, have found that there are some differences in terms of gender differences on social comparison or a kind of fixation on weight related concerns those gender differences are narrowing to some extent because there's a remarkably powerful culture towards lean muscularity that's affecting boys as well and encouraging other maladaptive weight behaviors. But the fact is that there's really no comparison when we think about the ways the online experience is just um, exacerbating what is already a remarkably impossible double standard and constant socialization messages that females are getting, frankly, since birth. Um, and the social media is kind of taking what already was very, very challenging um, before the internet, and it's kind of now created just a nonstop barrage of content and feedback and pressure towards unrealistic standards and body shapes. Mitchiva, so what, as we think about this, like, so what group of kids are we most worried about? Um, you know, do, are, do we have clarity in terms of which kids are going to be most susceptible to the negative effects of, of social media? I think that there's a lot of potential risk factors that come into play that both depend on the types of adolescents who may have particular vulnerabilities, whether that's a highly anxious adolescent who is then engaging in social comparison more so, or somebody who has a lot of social anxiety as well, who um, this amplifies those types of experiences. It also depends on the ways that they're engaging and using social media. So for example, we've done some work on digital stress. And so adolescents who are experiencing more digital stress, feeling this need to be constantly connected, um, this fear of missing out, these types of reasons for going online and using social media may be more maladaptive and negative for adolescents' well-being. Adolescents who experience more digital stress are more likely to experience depression a year later. Yeah. So, so those are the kids that we're just, that we're most worried about. They're, they're more vulnerable. The other group of kids that sort of brings to mind to me, um, just in terms of thinking about how they're doing with this are, are sort of marginalized youth, um, underrepresented, you know, underrepresented. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, those kids and, and sort of what the worries we have with, with those kids specifically. And, you know, you know, to the point, I, you know, we started off in terms of, um, you know, the conversation of like, there's, there's actually some pieces in terms of social media that's really positive for these, for these groups, right? Because they can sort of find each other and support each other. Um, but on the un other end of things, um, they're probably vulnerable as well in their own way. So um, any thoughts there? 
Yeah, so we do find that kids from minoritized or marginalized populations are being exposed to a remarkable amount of cyber hate, discrimination, bias, uh, bullying. Um, and what's what's tragic is um, that the research is showing that even, even though there some, or some kids are getting those same kinds of experiences offline, there's something about the online experiences that actually is making it much worse. And it's probably because the kind of cyber hate that happens on the hate that's expressed online is often harsher and more explicit than what's seen offline because kids can do it um, anonymously. There's a lot of pylon with comments and like buttons, and um, and it, it sometimes creates kind of more of a polarization, kind of uh, um, polarized kind of set of comments and response. So kids are experiencing more depression and anxiety for experiencing these things online, even if they were getting it offline. And also um, kids who are not the targets of the cyberbullying are also showing effects simply by vicariously experiencing and watching it happen to their friends or their peers um, online as well. And what, one of the one of the areas of research that I saw was, you know, just sort of along the same lines in, in terms of like sort of cyberbullying um, was that the kids who are, are actually doing the bullying as well also do poorly. And so, you know, so nobody wins in, you know, in these situations. Um, but but really interesting to see that, you know, so we already know that kids who get bullied. So and, you know, aside from social social media, so kids who get bullied, bullied in their lives um, have higher rates of depression, anxiety and suicidal ideation, as well as um, suicide. And so really just sort of scary to hear that, um, that those numbers are even increased as, as we think about it um, um, online. Um, thank you for that. So, you know, we, we, we talk about the fact that um, these platforms, you know, do, you know, th this question in terms of these platforms having a responsibility. So two weeks ago, I think it was just two weeks ago um, that the attorney generals of 33 states filed a, the lawsuit against Meta saying that the features of Facebook and Instagram are knowingly addictive and harmful to children's mental health. Um, and we know that, you know, our, our government has a hard time agreeing on anything, but they agreed on this. Um, there was very strong bipartisan support. Um, so can you speak a little bit more in terms of um, well, number one, are you in agreement in terms of really sort of holding them responsible? And then um, specifically, like, what should they be doing? Like, what can they do? And what should they be doing to, to sort of um, help keep our kids safe? Well, you know, I can't buy a flashlight for a child without there being an insert in the in the box that says, don't play with this in the bathtub and make sure you're shutting it off safely and don't, you know, keep it next to something that's flammable. Um, but these are products that are available for our kids to use, maybe even encouraged to use. And there's there's no such information that's available, particularly in child friendly language that allows for kids to make informed decisions that understands how their privacy um, and how their data may be used or how they may be at risk. And um, so at the at the very least, I think there's an opportunity for really helping kids to understand some of the pros and the cons. Um, teaching them how to engage in these platforms and what could be very helpful ways and helping them to develop competencies. You know, um, when kids reach the age of driving, we don't just give them the keys and say, good luck. We make sure that they have written tests and, and performance-based tests to demonstrate that they're competent so they don't harm themselves or others. When it comes to these platforms, however, you know, there's no such competency building. They, they literally just are given the keys and they're just on the, you know, World Wide Web um, and can navigate wherever they want. Um, but the tech companies could potentially, you know, build this in. Um, there is an act called the COSA bill, the Kids Online Safety Act, and it has um, almost reached the number of signers at this point to hopefully reach the Senate floor. Um, everyone can play a role by contacting their, um, their folks in the Senate or the House and urging for the passage of this bill or bills like it um, and play a role. This is one, as you say, there's bipartisan unanimous support in committees. And now it's about to get to the floor if enough people urge their representatives to do something about it. So that's a, a very real possibility that could happen soon. So that's a plug for us all to, to reach out and, and get involved with us. Um, I have to imagine that uh, one of the hardest things in your all research is 
being able to sort of keep up with the technology that that's always evolving, right? Like it, it feels like it's always changing. Something else is sort of, kind of there's new apps, new ways to communicate. Um, so any, any trends that, um, that you're seeing, you know, sort of like coming down the pipeline um, that might sort of affect adolescent mental health in either a positive or, or negative way? Yeah, I think this is, I mean, it's tricky as researchers, it's it's tricky to also to predict the future of what this is going to look like for adolescents, given how quick tech changes and how these platforms are evolving and changing so much. Just a few years ago, Dr. Princeton and I were asking questions based on the current state of the technology and really thinking about what is it that adolescents are actively doing on these platforms. And just in the past few years, AI has totally reshaped what that looks like. And it's not just what adolescents are doing, but how are these technologies actually changing adolescents' experiences? Um, and so our questions have to evolve and keep up with the tech. And I mean, looking, looking forward, I think that the AI pieces and the algorithms are a really important feature that we need desperately to study more and understand more. We need the tech companies to, you know, lift up the hood and let us see what, what those algorithms are doing and um, for us to be able to better understand really well the, 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 the really uh, uh, bi-directional ways that adolescents are coming into the platforms and the way the platforms are feeding into adolescents' experiences on them. You would hope that, you know, you sort of would hope that AI actually could be like, there could be some benefits here as well, right? It doesn't have to all be, all be bad. Um, so sort of thinking about, you know, uh, um, Dr. Tesla, you were, you were talking a little bit earlier about this question in terms of just like overall uh, digital media youth stress. And it's, I mean, it's, it's something that really resonates with me as, as I think about the kids that, that we see um, feeling trapped. They feel like they 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 can't get away. They feel like they always they have to be available to to respond in the moment. They can't leave their friend unread. One of the things I hear all the time, I can't feel I can't leave them unread. Um, there's like there is like sort of like this this tension that that comes with that. And then there's this piece in terms of like the constant stream of content that you know to be able to have conversations at school, I need to have seen that the latest TikTok um, or, or whatever. And then there's the, of course, the infamous FOMO, right? Like, what am I missing out on? Um, so is there anything more just in terms of like thinking about sort of the literature um, and in sort of like this, like this sort of tension? Because I think that's a lot of like where the questions come in, in terms of, you know, kids are sort of experiencing Oh, never mind my light. Um, <laughs> um, kids are, are sort of experiencing, you know, this, you know, as they live their daily lives um, and, and sort of like that connection with um, the, the sort of increase in anxiety and, and depression. And so um, any more just like thinking about it from like sort of the, the research standpoint. Yeah, I'm trying to, um, and, and Mitch, please stop step in in terms of the reach research perspective of it but like the connection overload the need to connect adolescents inability to put their phone down or this fear of missing out this isn't research actually this is just um from talking to teens um we teach a class of undergraduate students for example and, and we have lots of conversations with them about their tech use and looking back after having taken our class on technology and how it shapes adolescents what they would have done differently. And many of them say they, they wish their parents had um, put more limits on them, not given them a phone, a phone so early. And so I think communicating to adolescents that, that it's okay, you're not missing out, getting on technology a little bit later, changing the culture of, of teens experiences will be really beneficial to their, to their, to their, to their well being Cause in the moment they really do feel that that fear of missing out, that connection overload. But when they look back as young adults onto that time, they actually see that that they didn't need to feel that way or experience those feelings and it did more harm than good. And, and they could have delayed using it or they could have gone to bed and not kept their phone next to them connected around the clock. Um, so helping them understand that I think will be really key. And there needs to be potentially a peer movement to help sort of change that culture of, connection overload and this need to be connected around the clock. And then, and then it's, it's sort of this piece in terms of parents, right. As well. 
Um, so empowering parents to maybe not give that phone when everybody else, right. When everybody else has, has the phone. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as I think about conversations that, um, I've had with parents, a lot of times they feel helpless. Um, there's this, this sort of sense of helplessness in terms of, well, I, I gave the phone, um, and now how do I like, how do I bring it back? Um, is there, you know, how, how do I sort of answer my child when my child is saying, but everybody else is on it all the time. And you're going to make me, you know, sort of be really different and that's going to make me feel bad. Um, so, and, um, you gave a, a, a little bit in terms of like, sort of thinking about it from, from the parent perspectives and some practical guidelines, which I think is really, really helpful. Um, but anything more, um, you know, you know, as, as we, as we think of, of these parents who are in these situations where it's like, I've got a kid who's scrolling all the time. Um, and I need to, I need help, like, I need help in terms of like how I sort of move back from all that. Yeah, I, I can, um, I can relate to this as a parent of a 13 and 11 year old, as well as a researcher in this area and kind of collapsing across all those experiences, uh, a few things. One is that, um, you know, we have been very pleased that we've been able to talk with parents of our kids' friends and um, kind of band together and say, do we all agree that we're not doing phones yet? Or, you know, do we all agree that if we're letting them use it, we're going to tell them they have to stop at this time. So, you know, in, in creating that group culture, we completely have the power to do that um, if we work together as a community. Ironically, what's happening right now is just the opposite. Most parents um, tell us the number one reason why they're letting their kids have a phone or use it at times they would otherwise not want them to use it is because they're afraid that their child will be the only one not using it, and they're afraid their child will suffer social consequences. So let's be clear. There's no research that suggests that kids have social consequences, negative social consequences, if they are told to stop using it at a certain time of day, or if they don't get it for a year or two years, in fact, uh, later than everyone else. In fact, some research is starting to suggest that it's the most popular and socially competent kids who are not on social media because they find it to be so fake and it's so time consuming and they're losing that authentic connection. So, you know, there's really an opportunity to band together at the school level, at the grade level, at the classroom level, or just within your kids' friendship network. The second thing, and following what, um, what Eva is saying, is that kids in their 20s are telling us that they wish their parents had said, you have to get off the phone now or don't give it to me. And in some ways, what we're hearing is that it's so much easier for a kid to say, sorry, I have to get off. It's my parents' fault. than it is for them to say, sorry, I have to get off because I'm tired or I have to do my homework or I'm finding this to be really cumbersome. So you're kind of giving them an easy out by telling them, you know, tell them it's my fault as the parent. Tell them that I told you to get off and get some sleep and kids. Now, granted, there's all kinds of tantrums. There's all kinds of freaking out. But over some time, it's really helpful for kids to say, actually, I kind of appreciate that I was having to get off. And the last thing I'll say is it's very important for parents to realize that kids are learning some of this behavior from watching their parents. So um, kids report what researchers call technoference, the idea that when they're little, they find that their parents aren't making eye contact with them or attending to what they're saying because their phone is occupying their parents' time more than their, their kid is. And that makes sense. These are brilliant minds who put together these brilliant devices and platforms to keep us engaged. It doesn't make us bad people. We're just falling prey to the, the very things that they were built to do. But recognizing that in ourselves and maybe taking a family you know, tech holiday for a day or a weekend and talking together about it and being honest saying, you know, I'm having a hard time too. Let me tell you about what I'm thinking of and why I wish I was checking it right now and really together work on this. You know, let's all put our phones in a basket on top of the fridge at nine o'clock, including the adults, you know, even just doing that once in a while, because if kids see their parents doing it, they're more likely to learn that, yeah, this is just what we do in our family and I, and I have to abide by it. And I I'll get support from my parents because they know how hard it is. They are watching us all the time. Um, and, and that is, um, that that's a big piece of this, you know, and, and, and I'll say that, um, as we think about, you know, sort of handing over those phones, it's, it's sort of this question in terms of like, what are the expectations? 
Um, so what, you know, what are the expectations? So, you know, if, you know, if you are in the position where you've got sort of a younger adolescent and you're contemplating giving the phone, so maybe, maybe it's not a smartphone right away. So, so it's sort of this question in terms of like, can we ease them into it? Um, and, and in easing them into it, lots of conversations, um, as well as setting expectations, like this is what's okay and this is what's not okay. And, and, and sort of like, we're going to check in on this. Um, so a lot of this, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're learning, right? Like, so it's, I feel like we as adults also are, are learning um, in, in terms of how to have these conversations with our, with our kids. Um, Mitch, one of the recommendations from the health advisory group that you were part of really talked about, um, really talked about like this sort of notion of social media literacy and training kids, right? Um, which to the point in terms of like, how much do we leave to parents? And of course, of course, it, of course, as we're talking about, it needs to start at home. But, you know, in an ideal state, this is, uh, you know, this is for all of us to be thinking about. So can you speak a little bit um, to what your thoughts are in terms of like what that ideal state looks like? Who's all involved? Who's responsible? Um, and, you know, who's, who's part of this? I mean, you know, one of the things we've talked about at APA is that this is the this is the responsibility of everyone who cares for kids, including kids themselves. You know, we teach kids how to enter a world where they may be tempted to drive drunk. We teach kids how to enter a world where they may have the opportunity to engage in sexual behaviors and need protection. We prepare them for the world that they're going to have to live in. Well, this isn't going anywhere. Digital media and technology is here to stay for probably our lifetimes, at least. Um, we need to teach them how to live in that world too and how to do it safely. I can imagine every school doing a digital media literacy curriculum to teach kids how to get it. Ideally, those would be funded by the tech companies themselves to you know, help kids to have a healthy and positive relationship um, so that way they were learning uh, how to do that. I think that there's also um, ways just to have conversations. You know, A lot of parents, um, myself included, well, sometimes say, oh, I didn't grow up with this. I don't know why you're staring at this thing instead of instead of paying attention to, you know, me or your homework right now or something. And we accidentally are conveying the message that we don't get it. We think it's silly and we walk away from it. And we probably should do the opposite and say, I want to know everything about what you're doing online right now. Why is it so important? What does it mean when someone posts that? Why do you think people like that? Do you think they really like it or are they just trying to be nice to their friends? Like, the more we engage with them around this and we kind of lean into it, I think the more kids will say, hey, you know, I had a confusing thing happen online. Can I talk with you about it? Because otherwise right now they're like, oh, well, the last one I'm going to talk with is my parents about it because they're just going to tease me for being online all the time. I will mention two really quick resources and they're in our um, in, in APA's ancillary materials that accompany the health advisory. They have the exact links. But if you Google um, get bad news, I think it's stuck com or .org, um, it teaches you in a very fun way, and it's appropriate for kids, how to spot when it's mis- and disinformation rather than real credible information. And there's another one developed by psychologists called Spot the Troll. Again, forgive me, I apologize if it's .com or .org, but they teach you how to spot when an account is a real account versus a bot account that's trying to fool you. I have done both with everyone in my family. We talked about it together. We all made mistakes together. We all learned from it and we still reference it to this day. Um, so we're, because it's tricky out there and we have to learn and those are ready-made free, just up online for people to be able to use. So, so it really is um, a lot of what I think I'm I'm hearing from you is is it's really having conversations, making sure that we're looking at you know these these platforms together, um, and well and and you just gave a great tip in terms of like how we can use technology to help us spot um, you know things that that aren't accurate. Um, so, you know, as we think about like all the voices that, you know, we, we think about all the voices in these conversations, uh, you know, we've talked about tech companies, we've talked about parents, um, we've talked about really thinking about schools as being part of this as well. And I, th I think that they're anxious to, to, to really be involved um, and even thinking about the kids um, and really loved sort of what um, you sort of brought to the table in terms of thinking about what our young adults are saying, um, you know, like thinking back about in, in terms of like what they 
uh, we're we're feeling as as adolescents. Um, but do we do we have data in terms of like what um, adolescents are feeling like right now? As as we think about sort of you know adolescents in the moment, is there is there good data in terms of um, what they're sort of feeling and saying um, about social media? Yeah, I mean, there's there's different ways to get at this kind of question of of what are adolescents thinking and feeling in the moments when they're engaging in it. Um, there's research that uses qualitative methods. This is essentially interviewing adolescents and, and asking them um, their opinions. Many adolescents talk about lots of the positive sides of social media use, but some do bring up um, the stressors and negative side of it. There's also ways of of collecting data in the moments of adolescents' daily lives. So for example, we can ping adolescents um, ironically on their phones um, to collect data from them in the moments throughout the day. And we ask questions, for example, about feelings of social connection or reward sensitivity or thrill seeking. And what we find is that in the moments after adolescents are engaging in social media use in order to connect with their peers, they're actually reporting in those same hours that they feel this greater urge to engage in social behaviors and reward seeking behaviors. Um, they also are showing fluctuations in their mood so that both positive and negative feelings of mood. So it seems to be that there are these really tight connections with how they're engaging on social media and the way that they're feeling in those moments that are really important to pay attention to. And then what about, you know, um, and what about strategies? Um, you know, a lot of times sort of the questions sort of come to um, strategies for our teenagers. Um, you know, they'll talk about the fact that, you know, they feel this tension. They, you know, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I thought I was going to do five minutes on TikTok, 45 minutes later, I'm still scrolling. Um, are there any strategies that, um, that you know, you, you can sort of, uh, give to our audience in terms of thinking about from the adolescent perspective? Absolutely. You know, adolescents are probably not going to do something just because an adult told them you really have to do that. So instead, we have to help adolescents to reach this decision themselves. And there's a couple of ways to do it. One is, especially for those that are younger, is to have a discussion with adolescents to help them understand why it is that social media exists. Is it the case that people invested billions of dollars and thousands of hours to give them an opportunity to interact with their friends just to be nice? No. Someone's making a profit. Someone's using the data. Someone is, is doing this because they have a vested interest in doing it. I spent some time with my kids going into the Apple store and pulling up some of their apps, Candy Crush types of apps and weather apps and showing them this isn't a weather app at all. It's taking the information of what you're doing on your other apps and it's sending it to a company so that way they can give you marketing. And they're like, what do you mean? The weather app isn't just for the weather? I'm like, no, of course not. It's, it's, it's being used for this purpose. And all of that is listed in the app store under the privacy tab for any app. And this was the way that we started the conversation with our kids to say, you know, it's not just a world where people are making things to be nice to children. People are, are doing this to make a profit. And that helped them to, and I've seen this uh, being done in schools too, to start having more critical conversations of, wait a minute, how, how is my engagement in this platform being used in ways that I don't know about or I don't wish to? The other thing to do is to just simply ask kids to monitor for themselves. Wait, you're about to pick up the phone. How long are you expecting to be on there? What are you going on, on there for? And then when they get off, which could be eight and a half hours later, to say, how long did you end up spending on there? Did you meet your goals? And how do you feel right now? And the more that they do that, they'll start realizing, I promise, whoa, I expected to go on for five minutes, send one text or check my feed once and get off. I was on for three hours. I ended up scrolling through things I had no intent of doing. And I actually feel worse about myself right now. And the more that they start making those observations, the more they themselves will start coming to the decision you know, I don't know if I should go on this as often as I do. I always report I feel bad when I'm done with it. So but we have to help adolescents feel like this is their decision to make. That's great. That's great. And I see that Lonnie has just popped on. Hi, so we're at 7.55. We have a few minutes left. What a great conversation. Mitch and Eva, thank you so much for that great PowerPoint as well. Uh, for those of you wondering, um, we're going to be sending that PowerPoint to our 
post-production person who will make sure that he dovetails in the slides in a way that they'll be part of the final recording. So you'll get those. We're also going to include uh, many of these links that we've been putting in uh, from things that um, this conversation has, has bubbled up. So uh, don't panic. It'll all be part of the email that'll go out via the Zoom platform. So first, I want to say thank you, Eva and Mitch. Thank you so much for spending time with FAN. We're looking forward to after hours in about five, six, seven, eight minutes, 10 minutes maybe from now. Uh, so people, we hope that you can come join, ask more questions. Claudia, I also want to say thank you for such a gracious expression of gratitude at the front. Um, you know, it is right back at you. Compass has been such a strong partner of FAN for years and years and years. Uh, you guys were right there from day one when you opened your doors. Um, really appreciate everything that you and David do to help support and keep all of this free and open to everyone so that there's no, no barriers for people getting this incredible information. So uh, I do want to bring up one question that comes up in a couple different contexts uh, that was not quite uh, directly answered of the many things that were addressed here. Um, there's a lot of educators, a lot of school principals, school administrators on the Zoom right now and who had registered ahead of time. And I think what they're they're wondering is, is there any research, any signs, anything that you know about, maybe things in process about the effect of cell phones in classrooms, cell phones in school buildings? Um, you know, more and more schools are taking a little bit of a harder line. They're having students deposit cell phones in a place at the start of a class. Do you have anything that you can bring forward to uh, help give some more enlightenment about that? Yeah, there is some research that says that cell phones in classes are not only related to lower grades for the kids who have the cell phone in their hand, but also the kids sitting behind them because it's a distraction to that kid and they're often looking over their shoulder. So it actually is affecting several people's grades. So these new rules that are coming in, some European countries as well, to put them all in a, a locker until lunchtime and after school is very consistent with the science on what's best for kids. Yeah, and so frustrating for the teacher too. You know, the psychological <laughs> well-being of the teacher um, you know, no one. I mean, if you, if the five of us were sitting around a table somewhere and, and you were noticing that I was picking up my phone and giving very good reasons why I had to look at it. I mean, there's just a, although it's so common now, it doesn't make it great, right? You still have like, oh, I guess I'm not interesting enough for you or whatever, you know? And it's kind of interesting for the teachers. I wonder um, day after day after day after day after day of kind of being blanked uh, by many of the people in front of you, it kind of makes you wonder, um, you know, what that contributes psychologically to the educator, the adult that's in front of the room trying to make a connection as well and, and feeling thwarted, you know, I would imagine anyway, I'm not a teacher, but I just play one on TV. Um, last question, what time are we at? 7.58, so we have time for one more. Um, there is, of course, as you can imagine, in some of what you're talking about, uh, people wish they could have the Wayback Machine and kind of as you're talking, especially it was sparked when you were talking about how well so many people are saying, gosh, I wish my parents would have kept the phone away from me. I wish my parents would have done something different. And people are like, ah! you know, so they're kind of like, okay, what can I do right now? Um, so kind of a little bit like, okay, you know, the horse, the cow is out of the barn. Is there anything we can do to drag at least a portion of the cow back in the barn? So any thoughts on that to close out? Yeah, I think the number one advice to give to parents and teens themselves is to keep a phone out of the bedroom at night. They're they're way too inclined to reach out to that phone and this is going to disrupt their sleep. And it's the thing that's the most supported by science. So after 8 or 9 p.m., no more technology use for school administrators, teachers who assign homework assignments that have an online due date. Don't make that be midnight, make that be earlier in the evening so that adolescents get off technology and are not looking at their screens late into the evening. So I think that's the easiest, lowest hanging fruit for all parents, teachers, teens to, to um, implement in their daily yeah. lives. Eva, is that suggestion for at what age all the way through 12th grade are you suggesting all the way till senior year in high school? I would say for every age that somebody is alive, they should not be on their phone at night. It'll disrupt adult sleep as well, but but certainly all adolescents whose sleep is already deprived and whose brains are are especially needing of that of that really high quality sleep. So across the adolescent years, definitely. But for parents too, keep, keep the phone away at night. <laughs> Okay, thank you for that. We appreciate it. So we're at eight o'clock. Everyone, thanks for jumping in. Hope to see you maybe tomorrow night as well with Ben Widlavsky. Got a lot of great pro pro programming next week as well. Uh, after hours, it's going to start at 8.05. We're going to give these nice folks a five-minute break in between these two things. 
Uh, send a donation to FAN, any dollar amount, and come join us at After Hours. Thank you, Eva, Mitch, Claudia. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Thank you, everyone, and good night.